Are you as tired as I am? What an amazing day. Thank you so much for the invitation to come here. I have met some wonderful people, a lot of wonderful people. I have talked and talked and talked all day long. My voice is fragged. I sweated. I got sunburned. At the, um, I, mean, I had tears in my eyes when the sun disappeared. I've been waiting for that for seven years and only lasted for three minutes. <laughs> <laughs> but what an amazing thing. Uh, before we get into the topic, this is going to be a fun topic. Do you hear the ringing? I'm afraid to talk loud. Okay, um, before we get into the topic, which is going to be a fun topic, let's uh, review a little bit. Oh, I'm sorry. I, that I forgot all about that. Let's, um, let's review our little um, experiment that we run outside. Today, I went on the um, NOAA website again. I typed in all the times and the a latitude and longitude to, to get a curve, which looked almost the same as Saturday, but it's a little bit different because sun has moved. The sun, every day, the sun takes a different path through the sky. Almost the same path, but not quite exactly the same. So this is our, our data page from two days ago, and those were the results from two days ago. How do you think we did today? Yeah, I hear a yes. Very good, little baby. All right, okay. <laughs> well, these... Our today's values overlapped with Saturday's values. So way to go, everybody. You are excellent scientists. You have effectively tracked the course of the sun through the sky for two consecutive days or two different days and did extremely accurately. And th these numbers only fit with a sun that goes around the earth, period. Just saying. Now, there's a bunch of materials out here on the tables. I would love to not take materials home with me because UPS is expensive. So this is your last chance. Get out there, you know, exit through the bookstore kind of jag, uh, rag thing. Uh, please take a look at uh, Creation Magazine if you haven't already. Those are there. Uh, I would love to get that into many family hands as possible. Don't forget our website after I'm gone, creation.com. We have provided a wealth of information for you. Now, you're well aware of that, but you have to feed yourselves. I can't do it. Okay, that's the intro. You ready for some Bible? Genesis chapter 1, verse 11. Third day of creation week. And God said, let the earth sprout vegetation, plants yielding seed and fruit trees bearing fruit in which is their seed, each according to its kind on the earth. And it was so. You've read that before, right? How much time have you spent thinking about what that actually means? How about this one? Day five of creation week. So God created the great sea creatures and every living creature that moves with which the waters swarm according to their kinds and every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. How many birds? How many of the fishes? And how many of each kind? How about this one? Day six of creation week. And God said, let the earth bring forth living creatures according to their kinds, livestock and creeping things, and beasts of the earth according to their kinds. And it was so. And God made the beasts of the earth according to their kinds, and the livestock according to their kinds, and everything that creeps on the earth ground according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. You got it? That is the end of biblical taxonomy. And it didn't tell us very much, did it? I want to know a lot more about the natural world. I want to know a lot more about the living things that God created. But we're only giving a very, very rough sketch. And strangely, the Bible would call bats birds and whales fish. Is that a problem? It sure is embarrassing. But consider that Genesis is not a taxonomy book. Modern taxonomy didn't come along to the work of Carl Linnaeus, a wonderful uh, Christian, as far as I know, as, as far as his testimony goes, definitely a creationist. And he gave us the modern classification system where we go kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. So humans are in kingdom animalia. We have all the same characteristics as animals, except they can't think, but we have all their characteristics, or even biochemically. We're in phylum chordata. That means we have a spinal cord. Well, some chordates have vertebra. Some don't, but all the chordates are there. We're in class mammalia, which is a subgroup of the vertebrata, which is a subgroup of chordata, the class mammalia. We're in order primates, okay? Family hominidae, genus homo, species 
sapiens. Notice vertebrates wasn't in there, right? But it could be a group. There's a lot of different ways of doing taxonomy. In fact, modern taxonomists, they don't reference Carl Linnaeus' work anymore because there's infraorders and suborders and subclasses and there's every single possible division. They don't think this way anymore. They just think in branching trees, but the trees don't evenly branch. But this was a wonderful system to get everything started. But as I mentioned a minute ago, all the flying and swimming reptiles and mammals were created on day five, not day six. So pterosaurs, bats, and birds are created on day five. That doesn't mean that Genesis calls a bat a bird. But the word bird or op in Hebrew means something that flies. It's not making any evolutionary assumption at all. It's just grouping all the flying things together. Now, is that weird? Does that make sense? Well, you know what? Modern people do it all the time. Now, I'm a marine biologist. You ever heard of the word plankton? You know what plankton is? It's all this little stuff that swims in the ocean. You could have plants. You could have baby fish. You could have microscopic things that never grow any bigger. It's just all plankton, things that, little things that swim. There's also necton. Those are the larger things that swim. There's also the benthos. That's everything attached to the bottom. That's weird. But the biblical way of naming things is also true in modern science. We use exactly the same functional classifications. It's just... It's weird when you first notice it in the Bible because it seems like it's anti linnaean And it sounds like it's anti-evolutionary the way it's, but it's not. It's just functional categories. You okay with that? So is a whale a fish? In Hebrew, yes. It's something that swims in the water. Okay. Nothing wrong with that at all. Now, I want to introduce you to something. It's called the baramin or the created kind. Now, baramin is not a word. It's a Hebrew-sounding word. It does not appear in the Bible. It is a combination of two different Hebrew words, bara, to create, and min, type or kind. So the created kinds, the passage I just read, it said, according to their kind, according to their kind, according to their kind, multiple times. But God did not tell us how many kinds, how many are in each kind, or what are the dividing lines between the kinds. That's something for us to explore and discover. And that's what makes biology amazing when we start looking at these things. But so that's what a baramin is. It's a created kind. We assume that it's a group of organisms that can interreproduce. And if they can't reproduce, then the, other, the things that can't reproduce with them are a different kind. So all the cats in the world are one kind. Because all the big cats can interbreed with the medium-sized cats. The medium-sized cats can interbreed with the smaller cats. The smaller cats can breed with the wild cats. And wild cats can breed with house cats. Now, lions and house cats never interbreed because one of them gets eaten. <laughs> but theoretically, there's a chain of connectivity that spans all of the cats in the world. That would be a created kind. We're going to get into that more. Because just because things can't interbreed doesn't mean they're not the same created kind. We'll get to that. Hold it. But we have to talk first about what is a species. That's difficult. As a biologist, I cannot define that word. Because we use it different ways. And there's some population biologists say, though, this herd of caribou that lives on this side of the mountain chain and this herd of caribou that lives on this side of the mountain chain, you might as well call them different species because they never share genes. They're completely different isolated subpopulations and they're going to speciate. So they want to call them different species. And then there's people say, well, the giraffes that live on this side of the Zambezi River have slightly different markings than the giraffes on the other side of the Zambezi River. That's true. So they want to call them different species. Put them in a zoo, though, and they make baby giraffes. So there's not a reproductive barrier there, but they definitely are different. Lions and tigers can interbreed, but they look very different. They act different. There's no, no, no problem calling them different species, as long as we're not thinking in evolutionary terms. A very interesting paper appeared in Science a couple years ago. Elizabeth Panisi, she writes a lot of editorials in Science. And her, ed her title was Shaking Up the Tree of Life. Species were once thought to keep to themselves. Now hybrids are turning up everywhere, challenging evolutionary theory. 
And it's a picture of two different butterfly species, two individuals from two different butterfly species mating. Wait a minute. And she asks a question. Why are we now only discovering massive amounts of hybridization between species? Take a guess. It's because Charles Darwin taught us that species change very slowly and species remain separate. Oh, it's because the Darwinian concept is wrong. That's why we're only now discovering it. Because despite the evidence that was in front of our faces for generations, the biologists have avoided it and ignored it or just shoved it in the closet and locked it up so the graduate students couldn't find the evidence because it's too challenging to Darwinian evolution. Because if species bleed together, they can never evolve in different ways. If you're supposed to be able to like, you know, these, these organisms go over here and they stay with themselves and they adapt to their environment and they change and change and change and all of a sudden you have chimpanzees versus humans. But if those things can share genes, they'll never speciate. And so they struggle. Well, I wrote a series of articles on this topic. Species were designed to change. Part one, how much change is allowed? Part two, speciation and the limits of change. Part three, the tangled web of life. And I said interbaraminic life or intrabaraminic. That's within a baramin, the crazy relationships we're finding amongst the species within a created kind. And it's fun. It's amazing. I also did a, a four-part video series on the Biblical Genetics channel on YouTube. Species were designed to change. If God created species to change, then change over time is not a definition of evolution. If God created species to change and adapt over time, then everything Charles Darwin wrote in The Origin of Species is a creationist argument. Thank you, Mr. Darwin. What you got next? What, the fossil record that doesn't have all those intermediate forms that you need? The fossil record that Darwin said should be full of intermediate forms, and he even he knew it wasn't 150 years ago? <clears throat> Consider that evolution requires a lot of experiments. Evolution doesn't have a direction. It's random. And all of a sudden, something changes color or grows larger or loses its claws or grows feathers. It's random. It does not know it, as if evolution is alive. But evolution doesn't know that some change is going to confer an advantage on some organism. It's blind. So the greatest innovations in evolutionary history should be covered with the greatest number of transitional fossils. Right? Whales evolving from land animals. How many millions of intermediate forms must there have been to make that unbelievable transition? Crinoids, starfish, brachiopods, clams, evolving from an earlier invertebrate ancestor. All of those things have radically different body plans. There should have been millions of experiments before, for, to form those different body plans. But you know what happens in the fossil record? Boom, there's crinoids. Kapow, there's starfish. Kazam, there's horseshoe crabs. They appear suddenly and they're still with us today, and they still look the same as they did supposedly billions of years ago. So sorry, Mr. Evolutions, that's your problem, not mine. God created these things in their incipient basic forms. Horseshoe crabs is a basic horseshoe crab type. And sometimes they're little, sometimes they're big, almost exactly the same throughout the fossil record. Um, trilobites. Well, there's like 30,000 species of trilobites in the fossil record. There are a lot of them. And they're very different from one another. And they're amazing and fun to study, but they're all dead, so we don't know if they're tasty. Just saying. <laughs> I wrote another article on, uh, on creation.com. Jacob's livestock, a, exa a biblical example of applied genetics. Do species change over time? Jacob sure changed a species. He took a flock of all white animals and change them into multicolored, speckled, or basically brown or black and white speckled and streaked animals in just a few years. Consider the coat color of polar bears versus brown bears. Is coat color very important for animals? Consider coat color of a zebra. 
Is coat color really important for animals? Yeah. And he changed the coat color of his flocks quickly. I did a, a, another video on my uh, biblical genetics channel, Jacob's Livestock Breeding Experiment. And that one video, strangely, gets consistent views every month. And I made this years ago, and it's like my most viewed video ever, and I don't know why. But in there, I explained the genetics of sheep. And strangely, unlike people, the dark colors are recessive. So you can have an all-white flock with hidden dark colors. And God told Jacob which ones to breed with the other ones. Jacob said, I bred the strong rams with the ewes, not the weaker rams. I don't know why, but he knew from decades of a long time, probably decades, I guess, of watching sheep breed, that those guys, oh, when that type of sheep mates with that ewe, I got a speckled sheep out of it. And that ram happens to be the stronger ram. So selective breeding, kapow! Sorry, I should use that word. Uh, I don't know. Exclamation point. Um, <laughs> allowed things to change very quickly. Now, Darwin knew that selective breeding was very powerful. And he used examples of selective breeding and farming to make different breeds of, of, of plants and animals. And then he assumed that that same thing can happen in nature. But selective breeding is extreme. You're taking that sire and releasing him into a herd of females and only that sire. That is extreme cutoff. Nature doesn't work like that. It's never that clean. And so he depended upon millions of years and long times. And he said even the slightest variation, if it confers a slight advantage over enough time, it'll win out. Slight? You ever hear the phrase signal to noise ratios? You ever get in a car and you're listening to the radio and it's going... You're trying to hear a good sermon, maybe a baseball game, or something you really want to listen to. And God said, and it's annoying because there's too much noise. Could you listen to that sermon for a hundred years and understand it any better? No, because there's too much noise, the signal is lost. And biology is inherently noisy. And the environment is inherently noisy. So this slight little variation, Mr. Darwin, I'm sorry, the environmental and, and biological variation is much greater than anything Darwin imagined. What we see, examples of natural selection, are the profound changes. Sickle cell anemia in Central Africa allows children to survive malarial infections. Therefore, they're much more likely to become adults and have children. That's extreme. But slight little variations in height or intelligence or weight or they mean nothing. Especially consider that diet and exercise have more of a profound effect than anything else. In fact, humans across the world are about six inches taller than we were 150 years ago. The tallest women in the world are in Estonia. The tallest men in the world are in Holland and the Netherlands. In the early 1800s, the tallest people in Europe were Irish. We have this concept of these short little Irish people, right? Yeah, because we have a concept of the people who survived the Irish potato famine. Before that, potatoes allowed them to have more calories than any other people in Europe, and they were big people. And then the next generation went through starvation, and the children that came out of that were not big because of the environment. In fact, the sicker you are as a child, the shorter you'll be as an adult. Because when you're sick, you don't grow. And you only grow at night, by the way. Your body elongates at night. That's when your bones stretch. And if you're sick, you don't grow while you're sick. The environment has a profound impact. So Darwin doesn't work, but selective breeding certainly does. So changing gears a little bit. You've seen something like this, right? The evolutionary tree of life. Something like that. Going all the way back to what they call Luca, the last universal common ancestor. I don't suppose any of you saw that Disney cartoon a couple years ago about that fish thing that came on land and ran, won the bicycle race. His name was Luca. His name was last universal common. They were trying to give evolution to kids. Again. Thanks, Disney. Anyway, I'm glad most of you didn't see it because it was, it was the bicycle race, 
race. He won it, and therefore his life was all better forever. What? That makes no sense. Sorry. You probably, if you've been around for a while, have heard the evolutionists lampoon the creationists in that we believe in a creationist lawn, that everything today is just the way God created it. Is that true? Are things today just like God created it? Absolutely not. So for a couple of decades, we've been talking about a creationist forest that God created incipient forms that over time made a, might have speciated. So the different types of pelicans or different types of penguins or different types of bears were some ancestral archetypal bear form that became brown bears, black bears, polar bears, uh, sun bears, probably panda bears. Okay? I want to put this thought on steroids. That is not what I think. This is rudimentary because God is a lot more creative than this. In fact, what I think is closer to this. This is a cover of a book called Corals in Space and Time. Now, the author is an evolutionist, but I remember when I saw this, like, this is amazing. What he's done, he's, he knows corals well enough. In fact, I, I used to be able to do this. I'm a little rusty now. But if you handed me a coral fossil, I'll tell you what family it belongs to. A crop rid, oh, Montastria. Sometimes I get down to species level, sometimes genus, but almost always I can tell what family it belonged to, no matter where you find it in the fossil record. That means that there's no evidence of evolution of identity families. The hybrid things where you can't tell, they don't exist. The families are distinct as soon as they appear. And there's radically different types of corals. But he notices that over time in the fossil record, sometimes the species kind of merge and split and morph and change. And so depending upon where you are in the fossil record, you see a different collection of species in this family. And he's looking at coral reefs today across the world. He says, you know what? This species over here in, in um, Arizona, in um, Australia, um, <laughs> looks very different than this species in Papua New Guinea. But when we put them in a tank, they can interbreed and make babies. Huh. But this other species looks very similar to the species in Australia, which is also in Australia, cannot interbreed with that one from Papua New Guinea. Huh. And so he has this braided concept that species can split and then merge. It's just like the same thing happened, I'm not saying species, but Africans can have babies with Europeans. And yet we look very different initially, right? And what happens when Europeans meet Africans? They have babies together. And the babies are intermediate. This is world history. You, okay, you Europeans, you're not European. The first Europeans were Neanderthals, genetically and archaeologically. After that came a group of people that are called hunter-gatherers. They didn't have farms, but they lived all over Europe. They had black skin and blue eyes, according to all the genetics. All the genetics. Weird. But they also carried Neanderthal genes because, you know, people are people, people do what people do, and Neanderthals and those people had children together. The next group of people were some farmers that moved up out of Turkey. That's the first time blue eye, blue, sorry, that's the first time a light skin got into Europe. The Anatolian farmers, as they moved into Europe, in fact, they went up through the Danube, they went across the Mediterranean. When they met in France and Germany, we could tell them apart because they had come up, they were genetically different, and they're living right next to the hunter-gatherers for a very long time, and eventually those populations blended together. But that's only 30% of the European genetics. The Europeans weren't in Europe yet. They were living out north of the Caspian Sea in Asia on the grasslands, and then they invaded and killed off most of the Europeans, and left babies with the others, because um, that's what invading armies do generally. And so you Europeans are a mix. The genetic differences between the hunter-gatherers and the farmers is greater than the modern difference between Chinese and Europeans. So if you want to call Chinese a different race, well, I'm composed of multiple races. Strange as that may seem, that's what it's telling us. Why? Because a, a barrowman can split and join and merge and do all sorts of strange things. So looking at corals, I love these animals. 
They're so beautiful and they're so different from one another. And that's, my, that's me. It's a, my, me scuba diving next to a dendrogyrus cylindrus, my favorite coral anywhere. And they're almost all dead in the Caribbean. It's very, very, very sad. But there's mushroom-shaped corals. There's boulder-shaped corals. There's you know, anemone-shaped corals. There's branching corals. Each one of these animals here is a different family of corals. Within each family, some of these families have hundreds of species. Literally hundreds. Some only have a couple. But they're very different. And you can just look at them. And you stare at them long enough, you realize, hey, there's differences here. Sometimes you have to look under a microscope. Because when you watch the skeletons grow, the skeletons grow in completely different ways. Those are corals. Each one of those, I believe, is a created kind. Each one has sometimes a tremendous number of species, and the species change over time. So I ask again, did God create everything the way we see it today? No. So forget the creationist lawn idea. That's just ridiculous. Now let me introduce you to my new topic. What I'm going to do is I'm going to draw three different planes through time, at creation, at the flood, and today. And I'm going to draw on each plane some traits, maybe height versus weight or height versus width or color versus speed or whatever traits, it doesn't matter. It's just a a two-dimensional, one trait versus another. And I'm going to draw a circle or a shape that represents the space that that Barriman occupies. So in this case, we're starting with only a little bit of variation in two traits. Then over time, as we go upwards, we get to the flood. And maybe some more variation has happened. Because as things reproduce, genes get shuffled. And as they get shuffled, you should be able to get more more differences amongst this thing. But then we have after the flood, maybe they split, maybe one dies off, maybe one merges into another, and then we have today. You know what this is? I call this a type one barrowman. There's gonna be three types. This is a type one, humans. We're the only barrowmen that we know how many individuals we started with. Two. People have this idea that there were two dogs, two bears, two cats in the garden, and Adam walked around and named them. You know, Fred the dog and Sheba the dog, and there's Sally the mongoose and Tim the mongoose. I don't think so. Because God would have created a functional ecology across the world. And it's not like only snakes existed in the garden. Snakes would have been distributed around the world, I'm assuming. But humans, we know humans started with two individuals. So therefore, we know that our genetics is limited because you have to put all that genetics in Adam and Eve. Okay, so I'm saying humans initially, then as the genes get shuffled, we might might change a little bit. We might um, develop some new characteristics of, you know, height, weight, skin color, something like that. And then after the flood, we had things like Homo erectus, Denisovans, Neanderthal, split off from the main branch, and then married back in, which is why all of you carry Neanderthal DNA. Oh, you okay with that? Okay, that's the easy case. There's type two and type three, but you okay with type one? Okay, type two would be a species with a lot more diversity, a, lot, a bigger range of those two traits, whatever the traits are, huge range. But in this case, God created many of them, and you can't tell the difference. There's no species, just a gigantic pool of a huge number of individuals, and there's some variation, but you can't speciate them. And then over time, we have the same pool again at the flood, and then most of them die during the flood. The flood, a lot of things went extinct during the flood. But the things that did manage to survive, only a few individuals survived. And then maybe they were able to fill up their original space. Or maybe they only filled up a, a small space, like lycopods. Not lycopods. Uh, yeah, um, um, yeah, lycopods. These giant tree-like things that are in the fossil record as coal are these little teeny things we find in swamps today. They were, I mean, as tall as this ceiling, and today they're little teeny things. They lost a lot of genetic diversity somehow, and they don't, they don't have the same space as they used to. They have a much smaller space. But in this case, something like horseshoe crabs, there's billions of them around the world. They kind of all look the same, kind of. 
And that's kind of a model for that. Does, does that make sense? Okay. Ready to step it up to complexity? This is where, this is where it gets fun. The type 3 barrenmen would be a group of organisms that are the same created kind, but they're broken up into little subpopulations. Like maybe barnacles that only live in cold water far north or far south. Well, they can't exchange genes across the equator because the water's warm. Or maybe one lives on the northwest coast of America and one lives on the northeast coast of America and they can't exchange genes across the Arctic Ocean or something like that. Not that North America exists that creation, but you got my point, right? You can have isolated little pockets or maybe a pond with saline water at a high elevation and cold temperature. And there's one here and there's one over there and there's one a thousand miles that way and the organisms are separate and they can't interbreed because they can't get to each other. But we have, so here I have five different little populations. Notice the one on the top left here, it went extinct for some reason. Boop. But notice these guys, they blended together. Maybe a migratory fish, I'm sorry, a migratory bird was sitting in a pond and he got some fish eggs stuck on his, his feet. And we know, actually know this happens. And then the bird flew to another pond a thousand miles away on his migratory route and he landed and this fish entered the pond. A fish with completely different genetics than the fish that are there. Maybe these fish are green and these fish are yellow. No green fish had ever been in this pond. And all of a sudden you introduce brand new genes. But it's a barren and interfertile. What happens? Those genes mix and now there's yellow fish. Where'd they come from? So species can change depending on how isolated they are and how they can share their genes. But then at the flood, most of these guys go extinct, but maybe two little populations survive. And notice this population, it bent and it went this way for some reason. Maybe it got taller or, or, or shorter. And, and this population almost divided into two, but it started with three. It really did start with three. Okay. Can species change over time, yes or no? Absolutely. In fact, they can change a lot. But there's another type of barrenman, type four. What's a barrenman again? A created kind. I, I want to ask you that because some people will be forgetting by this point. It's a created kind. The fourth type of created kind are the asexual organisms. Organisms that only make copies of themselves. They can only make copies of themselves. The only way for them to change is through just direct mutation, not through sexual reproduction. And therefore, they tend to stay the same until they die and go extinct. So in Daphne, a water fleas, there's a, there are some that are sexually reproductive, but a lot that aren't. They've just reproduced daughters and more daughters and more daughters for thousands of years now. They're making exact copies of themselves, and they propagate themselves through the fossil record. Who knows how many Daphne God created? He could create a billion different Daphne, each one in its own barrenman. Oh, that's kind of cool, isn't it? You're right with us? We're going to, now we're going to change gears again. You got the, the picture of the... Okay. Now let's talk about all the different ways that change can happen. This is critical for us to understand, to, to thwart the evolutionary nonsense. I don't know why, but God loved beetles. There's over a million species of beetles. Was Noah's Ark crawling with beetles? No, because beetles didn't have to go on Noah's Ark. They're not nefesh. Remember, we talked about that earlier, right? No? Oh. Did I not include nefesh in any of my talks? Okay. In Hebrew, there's a word, nefesh, two words, nefesh chaya. Nefesh chaya, if you want to say it that way. The soulish things, the things that breathe, the things with the breath of life in them. Not just humans, things that breathe. Birds, squirrels, fish. Hebrew would refer to those things as, as nefesh. In, in Genesis, absolutely, birds are called nefesh. And uh, the bird, beasts of the field are called nefesh. Okay? It doesn't mean they have a soul, as in we can talk to God sort of thing, but they breathe in soulish sort of a way. All right? They're alive. Plants are not alive. Plants are just chemical factories. Plants are food for other things. That's biblical definitions. They never call plants alive. Bacteria, the Hebrews didn't know about. 
Daphne, the Hebrews didn't know about until they invented microscopes. A lot, all those little you know, amoebas and paramecians, they have no idea those things even existed. The Bible doesn't talk about them, but they don't breathe. They're not nefesh. Insects, I believe, are not nefesh. They're on the edge, though. They're big enough and they move enough. They're on the edge. Earthworms are not nefesh. They don't have a soul. Squish an earthworm, whatever. But, you know, squish a dog. That's not whatever, but it's just, just a dog. It's not a human with a soul, but it's nefesh. All right? It's not my fault the Hebrews kind of muddy their way through this. It's just the way they do it. But looking at the beetles, they don't have to be on the ark. They just have to survive the flood. And there are millions upon millions of beetle species. However, how much diversity did God put into those initial beetles? Apparently, a lot. And beetles have speciated like crazy. But here's one way how you can get diversity and scramble it around. It's basically, the first way is just normal sexual reproduction. Imagine that God created a dog-like creature like this mastiff. It's a tall, muscular dog. Let's say you created a population of them. I don't know, pick a number. A thousand, ten thousand, doesn't matter. Whatever number it is, there's all these tall, muscular mastiffs. But one of them is carrying genes for short and skinny. That's the little T and the little M. So, um, sexually reproducing organisms have two chromosomes, and the different copies of chromosomes, you carry two of each gene. So here, they're, most of them are carrying tall muscular, two copies of tall and muscular, but one of them is called carrying short and skinny. But it is not short and skinny. It is tall and muscular because tall and muscular are dominant and short and skinny are recessive. There's a short skinny gene combination floating around in that population. You might never see it. It might have been a thousand years after creation, the first short skinny dog was born and Adam's, or Adam's dead by then, but Noah said, what is that? <laughs> Hey, um, hey, Mrs. Noah, you ever seen something like that? That's a dog? Because eventually, if that gene is in the population, it is possible for an individual to be born with two copies of that recessive gene. We can get brand new features that God initially programmed into creation popping out many, many, many years later. Can things change? Absolutely. It's part of God's design. But it's not only that. Notice that tall and muscular, I'm, I'm drawing them near a line. They're right next to each other on the same chromosome. So we're always inherited as a set, except every once in a while, you might get a recombination between those two genes. Now, the probability of recombination is inversely proportional to how far apart they are. If they're really close together, you're not going to get a recombination too often. But when you do get a recombination, all of a sudden you're bringing new letter combinations together. And if you draw the famous Punnett square, where you have all the four combinations you can get from the father and all the four combinations you can get from the mother, or whatever that order is, and you add them together, you're going to get in dark gray here, most of the dogs will be tall and muscular, even if they're carrying the recessive genes. A very small portion will be short and skinny. But you have now new combinations. We have tall and skinny, like a wolfhound. And we have short and muscular, like a bulldog. This does not require evolution. This is God's brilliance. God front-loading these organisms with potential change in the future. He didn't create bulldogs in this example. He created the potential for bulldogs to spontaneously appear. That's cool. Now I'm thinking of all the things in the created world and saying, wow, all this potential variation. There's another way we can get variation. Uh, Barbara McClintock got the Nobel Prize for figuring out that in corn, specifically, is, this, is it politically incorrect to say Indian corn? It probably is. So Native American corn, okay. <laughs> I, I'm, um, I'm not mocking, I'm, I just want to be sensitive because, you know, people get mad. Um, but the different colors of the corn, corn kernels are caused by something called a jumping gene or retrotransposon. It's a piece of DNA that pops out of the genome and goes and sticks somewhere else. And as it's popping around, it's turning genes on and turning genes off. It's affecting the color of the corn kernels. Retrotransposons are a design feature to cause change. In fact, it's 
phenotypic change. Phenotypic, oh, that's a big word. So we have a genotype, that's all genes you carry. The phenotype is the way the organism looks and behaves. So this gene is affecting the way the organism looks. It's changing the color. But there's another way we can get changed, and that is through mutation. There are some genes that if that gene mutates, the organism's dead. You can't change it. There are other genes that can easily change. And one of the most variable genes we see across the whole um, vertebrate world, or at least the mammalian world, is the coat color genes. The same exact changes in humans and dachshunds. Our skin colors and hair colors. Now, we have one solid pattern on our bodies. A lot of animals have different patterns on their bodies, which is interesting, but it's the same genes causing the same colors. Red, brown, light colors, black. It's just variations in melanin content with the same genes driving it and the same mutations popping up in horses and dogs and bears causing very similar color changes. That's very interesting. But So when God wrote out the genome, he's like, okay, here's a gene for coat color. He knew the rules of chemistry, right? Well, if he puts a C there, he knows that that C is much more liable to mutate to a T than if he puts an A there, because A's very infrequently mutate to a G. So when God wrote out the genes, he wrote the potential for chemical changes on top of the genes to induce changes later on. And if he didn't want the gene to change, he wrote G, 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 G. Not that you can do that, but he put a lot of Gs in there because they don't mutate as much because God's smart. There's another way you can get change over time, and that's through inbreeding. Because in, during inbreeding, you lose a lot of genetic diversity. And there's a lovely example in Scripture Starting with Terah, you have Abraham who marries his half-sister, Sarah, and they give birth to their brother, I mean the son, named Isaac. <laughs> Genetically identical to a brother, he just has long pieces of identical DNA. Well, Isaac marries his first cousin once removed and first cousin twice removed times two, Rebecca. Yuck. Their son, Jacob, marries his first cousin, Rachel, and first cousin, Leah, but they're much closer than first cousins. And then we have the 12 sons. I put Dinah in there also, but the 12 sons of Jacob, the 12 patriarchs of the tribes of Israel. If you follow the longest route, you know how you inherit half of your parents' DNA, right? And 25% of your grandparents and an and, and eighth of your great-grandparents and a 16th of your great-great-grandparents. You know that, right? Well, if you follow the longest route, these brothers should have about 3% of Terra's DNA. But they also inherit it through this route, and this route, and this route, and that route, and that route. They have 22% of Terra's DNA, not 3%. And according to laws of, bio, uh, laws of genetics, they're going to have huge sections. In fact, probably about 10 or 11% of their genomes are exactly the same on both copies amongst all the brothers. So if there's a, a thing in there that, that affects the shape of the head or the shape of the nose or the skin color or the height or the broadness of the face, they, they could all have the same exact genes. So you could be walking down the street to some ancient village say, oh, there's an Israelite. Because of inbreeding, losing diversity, and concentrating certain characteristics. Wow. That, my friends, is the origin of races. I wrote this article, Inbreeding and the Origin of Races in the Journal of Creation. It's on creation.com now. In fact, that family tree, if you want to look at it, you go find it. It's really cool because there's a lot. Yuck. Here's, here's Esau marrying his aunt. Whoa, weird. Okay? So that's a fifth way you can get changes. A sixth way. And that's your simple individual choice. I choose to live not in Miami, Florida. I lived there for nine years and I was miserable. I almost sweated to death, <laughs> even in January. It was just hot all the time, except in the winter, in the summertime, inside it was freezing cold because everything's air conditioned. You had to bring a coat to work in the summer. What? I choose to not live further south. Even Atlanta is miserable from March till October. Maybe May if I'm lucky. 
all of my ancestors came from Northern Europe. I am Southern Norwegian, Northern German, Northern German, Northern Dutch, English, English, Irish, 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 and Irish. So when it's cold and rainy outside, I'm like, yes, ancestral weather, <laughs> let's go conquer and pillage. <laughs> so individual choice is profound because individuals will choose to live in environments that they like better, but they like it a lot of times based on their genes. And so you can get a population just spontaneously segregates. Oh, and bringing their gene, you can speciate just because of choice. Interesting. So there's six different ways that things can change, but things also change in response to the environment. Because, you know, it's, it's kind of easy to imagine that some things like their environment better and therefore have more babies than things that don't like their environment, right? Things that are struggling to survive, they don't tend to have lots of kids, but things that love it, man, happy as can be, lots of offspring. That's called natural selection, by the way. But once you have change over time and you realize that environments are not static, even in Eden, had Adam and Eve not fallen into sin, the environment would not have been static. If you have a river running over rocks, that river will dissolve the rocks. Oh, it might take millions of years. That's fine. Adam and Eve to live forever. That's fine. But they will see changes. Shallow ponds will slowly silt up. What happens to the frogs in the pond? They're going to have to go hop somewhere else. But as a pond is, is, is slowly silting up, all of a sudden the plants that love to live in bogs will start growing there. And as the bug fills up and grows, then all of a sudden oak trees are going to grow there. You're going to have change over time. Even if it's really slow, if it, organisms can change in all these different ways I showed you. And if the environment can change, you're going to get changed. In fact, I wrote an article, Natural Selection in Paradise, where I claimed that natural selection is part of the creation order, not something we should run away from. It's just going to happen all by itself. For example, imagine that there's elephants. And elephants come around the forest, and they rip a tree down and eat the tree. What happens in the forest? A patch of sunlight opens up, and completely new animals and plants are going to live there. And as it grows back again, they're going to be replaced with whatever the mature forest looks like. But let's imagine that there's a mountain. And on this mountain are oak trees. And the top of the mountain is very dry. And the bottom of the mountain, there's a river and a marsh, and it's really wet down there. And imagine this oak tree population, one species of oak tree, one created kind, one species. There's a diversity of genes that help the oaks tolerate root moisture levels. And some of the genes allow the trees to thrive in dry environments, and some of the genes allow the oaks to thrive in wet environments. Can you see what's going to happen? Which one produces more acorns on the top of the tree? The one that likes dry roots. It doesn't mean the one that likes wet roots can't grow on top of the, on top of the I say tree, on top of the mountain. It means they don't grow as fast. So which one produces more acorns? The one that grows faster. So when the elephant comes down and rips down a tree and eats it, there's acorns on the ground. Which acorn is more likely to fill up that spot? The acorn of which there are more of. And if the ones that like dry roots produce a thousand acorns, and the ones that like the wet roots and living in the dry environment produce 10 acorns, probabilistically, a one that likes dry roots is going to sprout up there. And so over time, you're going to lose all the genes for the, for the trait of the trees that likes dry... Oh, sorry. sorry. Talk slow, Rob. Slow. Over time, on top of the mountain, you're going to lose the genes for wet roots. But at the bottom of the mountain, the exact opposite is going to happen. In fact, the trees might start growing buttress roots. A lot of trees in swampy areas will grow buttress roots. They might even look different. And they'll partition genetically into two different populations. They can still, they're still interfertile. I mean, I think all red oaks are interfertile with all red oaks. And I think all white oaks are interfertile with all white oaks. Interesting. I know the place where I used to live in Georgia, we were on a stream and it was a, 
an area that used to have a, a mill, and they, I, we know they had knocked all the trees down to feed the mill and whatever, and probably slaves had dug this channel, uh, a drainage channel on the side. It was, it was really weird, but it's it a forest that I lived in. But the oak trees, I'm being a nerd. I mean, I walk around and I, I'll get out my dichotomous key and I'll pull a, a branch down. I'll say, okay, does it have this kind of veins and this kind of thingies? And I'll try to figure out what species it is. I could not speciate the trees. Like five or six different ones. There's weird oak trees because they can hybridize a lot. They're one created kind, but they can also speciate. You okay with that? So, takeaways for you. One, God designed species to change. Two, the changes are prescribed by engineering considerations. A human can never sprout wings. Ain't gonna happen. Probability. Some changes are simply unlikely, but some are very likely. Bird losing wings is easy, but once a bird loses a wing, it can't ever get them back again. We see one-way changes, almost always downhill changes, but probabilistically, we see things happening. And time. Given God created diversity, given enough time, genes are going to get scrambled around and you're going to see brand new things popping out potentially thousands of years after creation. That's not evolution. This is God being a genius. But we have a problem with the definition of the word barren because, as I said earlier, we don't know how many there are. We don't know what the dividing line is between them. And just because two things can't interbreed like a house cat and a lion doesn't mean they are different created kinds. So we need to do a lot of work in this field, and people are doing a lot of work, but it's amazing and it's fun, and I love seeing this develop. And we just stole all of Darwin's thunder. Say, thank you much. What else you got to play with? Literally, change over time is a creationist idea, not an evolutionary idea. They have to come up with ridiculous probability claims. That's why they need billions of years, by the way. They cannot shave off the years. They need that for their miraculous probability to happen, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There's a lot more of this in Evolution's Achilles' Heels. Please pick up a copy, especially you students who like science. This will be really good for you. That uh, movie is also awesome. Uh, don't forget, on our website, you can stream the talk I gave the other day, uh, The Historical Adam, for free. There's a lot of other things on the tables. Please go home with something. You know how much money you'll save me if I... Every box... UPS has doubled their prices since COVID. It's killing us. So please, buy a book from me. Let me take home less boxes. And I'm going to leave you with 1 Peter 3.15, and we do have some time for questions. Happy me. Okay. In your hearts... Honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that's in you. You do it with gentleness and respect. Why be angry? The facts are on our side. They can be angry. Fine, be angry as much as you want. But sir, um, change over time is our idea. What else you got? God designed things to change. What else you got? I've heard people say, oh, you believe in change over time? Ah, you're an evolutionist then. Uh, no, not hardly. Let me explain why. And it's a great opportunity to share things that they don't expect to see because they've got really ridiculous ideas about what you believe. And hopefully, I've given some of you a more mature idea that is more robust to intellectual and scientific defense. Capiche? All right, let's pray. Father, again, we are humbled by your world. We saw amazing things today. And now we're presented with other amazing and complicated and frankly hard to understand things. But we're looking at your creative genius. Why would we expect to understand it? And yet you've made it mostly comprehensible. So thank you for giving us all these amazing scientific things that we get to think about, to be encouraged about, and just revel in your presence in the biological and the physical world because you're a wonderful God, an amazing God, and we rejoice, Lord, in everything that you've done. Help us to be good stewards of the knowledge that you've given us. and Help us, Father, to be willing to share it with other people. Amen.